right. I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again for joining me, Dad. I'm always grateful for our time together uh, in the takeover where I can and learn from you. And today uh, we're going to be talking about the only number that really matters. Um, so, you know, I've already told folks what that is, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that you can help us wrap our minds around um, on why this is so important. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, we'll talk about some practical ways <clears throat> that we can we can get better at um, at focusing on this number. Okay. So um, let me just start by asking you this. Have you always been focused on bottom line growth? Oh, heck no. No, in fact, I probably wish I would have learned the concept of focusing on bottom line a long time ago. Uh, for most of my career being a sales guy, all I cared about was sales. So how could I get more sales? Sales are good. Didn't even care about the profitability of the sales. It was just like, figured if we got more sales, then everything would take care of itself, right? Because sales cures all evils, all problems. If you just throw enough money at something, you can hide whatever's the problem. (laughs) So yeah, sales was it, right? So um, it wasn't until, I don't know, you know, 10 years ago that I started thinking, Hey, maybe it's not all about sales and maybe it's about more about the bottom line. And so trying to drive a little bit of my philosophy into changing that culture. So you said something happened about 10 years ago. Um, you had already been running the business. Mm-hmm. Um, it was handed down from your father and you had been running the business, I think for quite some time before this happened, right? Oh yeah, Absolutely. So what, what what was life back then? What was the mentality? Hey, we would celebrate record sales months. We would celebrate record sales years. We would, it was all about achieving double digit growth or, um, you know, always about sales, 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 sales. <clears throat> so it really wasn't until they kind of realized that sales wouldn't, at the end of the day, wasn't going to provide, um, the real true growth that we needed, right? That we needed to kind of focus on the bottom line, which would generate more money to focus on the top line. Um, So it kind of becomes a bit of a cycle. People don't realize that you have to have bottom line profitability to reinvest back into the business. And I probably was doing that all along, you know, certainly was always reinvesting in the business, but not realizing how it was actually technically happening, right? So I wasn't technically looking and, you know, going and having a discussion with our CPA and and we didn't have a a CFO at the time. We had a controller. So we weren't having those meaningful financial discussions that I then began having. So if I'm, um, so I'm hearing you correctly, uh, you, you said that you had to have the bottom line to reinvest in the top line. Um, But before there was really much of a bottom line, you were continuing to invest. I'm assuming there was, you had to, you had to, the only way you could do that was by, you know, racking up debt or what's the strategy? Oh, we were never totally debt adverse, but it wasn't really that we were growing totally through debt. We were reinvesting, but we didn't realize what we were doing. So it wasn't an intentional strategy. So kind of like playing a game, but never really having a strategy of how you were going to win. So when you make something intentional and then you measure on it, of course, then it becomes important. And so in the beginning, we we didn't really look at profitability at the bottom line. We looked at sales. And like I said, every celebration was about, hey, we just had a record sales month or, hey, we just grew. Um, Of course, in order to do that, oftentimes we're having to reinvest in new materials and buy more inventory, add more space. All these things were reinvestments. They were obviously coming from profitability. So, you know, we would measure profitability basically by, do we have any money left in the bank? Uh, Really pretty simplistic ways of talking about running a business. And it wasn't wasn't until, you know, it was probably more than 10 years ago, but it wasn't until I really started looking at the business and saying, um, hey, it's really all about the bottom line. And if I can double the bottom line, 
and achieve moderate growth on the top line, then I'm way further ahead. Uh, so that it's kind of a harsh reality. It's smaller numbers because the bottom line's not, you know, it's not like adding another million dollars in sales. So uh, that was always seemed to be more fun. But when we started seeing the results of focusing on the bottom line, it became fun really quickly. Right. right because at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's about, it's about making money, not necessarily just growing for the sake of growth. Right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and you know, you really, you look at the culture of our company and historically, we've always said that if you look at hierarchically, um, that the employee comes first on the channel, right? And then the customer is next. And then the third thing is the shareholders. And that's still true today. We our total tension and focus goes towards creating a great work environment with happy employees um, who are motivated to serve the customers that we have. And then that the customers are happy because they're being well served. And if all of those two things happen, then you should end up with a good bottom line at the end. Um, so there's a fine line, right? You don't want to, most companies, of course, put the shareholder on the top. So it's, it's all about the, the bottom line. It's all about the shareholder. And then they probably put customers and then they put the employees way down at the bottom. And we've always tried to manage our business a little bit differently than that. Um, when you manage to the bottom line, you may not have customer service or customer friendly policies or programs. You may not be um, geared towards new product development or design. You might not be looking at new markets. You might simply be saying, hey, it's all about the bottom line. So, um, you know, part of this, you know, I think I always think that part of these conversations for me is just kind of learning from what I've gone through. And, you know, I'm in this journey as a, running a small business myself mm -hmm. and kind of watching what you've done. You're, you know, light years past where I'm at now. And I can see that you've made some of the same mistakes. But I think that you're, you've talked about, um, like, finding this balance, right? Because if you're if you're so focused on the top line growth and you know, you're managing towards that, I mean, that's a different experience for both your employees and your customers and versus managing for the top line or for the bottom line growth. Um, and I think that what I've done is I feel like I've at times pendulum mm -hmm. swing between the two and, yeah. you know, just trying to figure out what is, what is uh you know, what is a, a healthy, uh, emphasis. Right. And, and I think it's very common to, to pendulum swing between the two because when you're entrepreneurial, when you're starting a small business or you, you've had a small business for or a medium sized business for years and years, you're innovative and you're constantly thinking, hey, what's the next great thing? What's another service or product I can add to my customers? And you want to jump right in and invest in it. Um, and oftentimes not realizing that that investment may be long term. You know, historically we've we've never really hit introduced a product that over was an overnight success. Uh, many of them are incredible successes, but they were never overnight successes. So it meant this big investment in people and in new equipment or new machinery and inventory, um, and new marketing and push it our sales force and advertising and that's all pretty expensive so it's fun because you're talking top line growth um but it's definitely taking away from bottom line revenues those would be dollars that might elsewise just you know sit on the on the bottom line and in your EBITDA line mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when it comes to you know other small businesses um that are out there whether they're industrial distributors or um manufacturers what what do you see is some of the main problems like why are they struggling to survive and thrive you know some of them um, are doing the right things they're investing and they're um, you know they're investing in technology and they're they're changing they're innovating the way that they go to market but I think the vast majority are kind of stuck in this survival situation where they're just trying to go month to month and um, you know, how do you get out of that zone where you're, where you have the confidence to invest 
and uh, but at the same time, focused on, you know, the the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that the number one problem that probably happens to most people is uh, pricing courage. So, and it's easy to see because these big customers that we call on, they have people that are trained to demand better pricing from us. Um, But many of our people don't get trained on how to rebute that, right? How how do I defend that comment? You know, hey, I'd really love to buy this thing from you, but you're a dollar and I need to buy for 60 cents. And you know, you know your cost is 50 cents. So you go, well, I guess making 10 cents is better than nothing. And you, mm-hmm. you, you sell it, right? Right. Um, and um, so it's about figuring out where the opportunities are to be competitive. So there's always places, right? I, I, I can pick up some significant volume. And if I pick up some great volume, then that's going to allow me to buy better. And the customers that I have, um, already with that business, I'll be more profitable on. So sure, that's a valid strategy, but it's also about finding those new markets, finding those product lines that you can sell that aren't necessarily price competitive, that people aren't shopping for every day. And there's plenty of them. There's plenty of things that people are buying that are unplanned spend that could make a significant business. You just got to look for them. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's so true. I think that in in our in our world, industrial supply, I think there's so many distributors that are so caught up in um, win, trying to win the price battle that unfortunately they are, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. and that's that's a real issue. And I think that we think that we just accept that. Oh, it's just my lot that I have to. I just have to compete on price and and operate on very thin margins, which means. That trickles through the whole organization. That means we can't spend much on marketing or sales. Mm-hmm. Can't have the sales team that we need. You know, we don't have the infrastructure. So that's a. It's it's really like a. You know, it's a cycle. Yeah, like you said. And there's great companies out there that can help you with pricing, and um, and many times their fees are based on simply how well they improve your bottom line. But, um. Yeah, looking at the, you know, and you've we've all heard of that, you know, hey, it might be time to fire a customer or whatever. Um, sometimes there's business that if you walk away from it, those dollars and the top line go away, but the bottom line just somehow magically grows uh, because you're not doing all those efforts to support that low profit business. And so it's really hard, though, trust me, it's hard to take a great customer and say, you know, Hey, I don't think I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, certainly you don't get to that point. You offer to try to get the prices raised and your margin raised and you develop a strategy or do something. But if at the end of the day you just can't, then sometimes that's a strategy that can work. But, um, so again, not about the top line. It's mm-hmm. about growing that bottom line and having those dollars to move on and fight another fight. You know, you said something that I thought was really, it's powerful because it gets to, you know, we're, we, a lot of times we just talk about the external factors that are um, out there with us. Like, what are my competitors doing? What do my customers want? Those are all external things. But you, you said something that was interesting. You said courage. Mm-hmm. And like, that's that's inside, you know, yeah. that, that's, that's us. We have to have the courage to... Um, to change our business model sometimes yeah. if we realize it's not serving us well, right? If it's right. not producing what we need it to produce at the end of the day, we have to have the courage to say, well, listen, you know, it's going to be embarrassing possibly, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to mean if I go to a customer and I explain to them, listen, I can't, can't keep selling you at this rate. I have to either increase your prices or we have to walk away. You know, nobody wants to do that, mm-hmm. especially, you know, CEO salespeople types, right? Right. Right. So it's uh, it takes a lot of takes a lot of courage. Well, how do you start to develop that courage? I mean, what have you done to kind of shift your focus over the years? Well, I think that it it has to begin with a with an overall strategy of saying um, we're going to do some better anal- analytics. And at the end of the day, you, 
you know, it's so fun to just look at sales and then look at ship, you know, book sales and then ship at the door sales. And, um, uh, and that's how, you know, you kind of run the business. But today the world is just all about data and analytics and, and you don't have to be a big company to have good data or to understand and do analysis on your business. So it's looking at that, at those customers and really trying to, um, get everybody involved and engaged on the same plan that says we're going to look for the highly profitable business and we're going to seek out those opportunities. And those are things we're going to follow. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's a training issue really at the end of the day too. So you not only have to train yourself, but you then you have to train everybody else around you. Right. Cause people that have a great, yes, we can attitude, a great, the customer is always right attitude are going to be very hesitant to tell a customer no. Um, or I, I can't, I can't take that order at that price or, um, so it becomes a training issue and you have to invest in your team to be able to give them that courage to say, Hey, I know this is a great price. This is a, this is a competitive price and not feel like they, they have to be bashed. And, you know, the thing I've always found is that um, being a manufacturer who sells through distributors is that because the distributor, so he's getting, he, she is getting beat up by the end user all day long, all the time about price. So it becomes kind of a mentality on their side when they switch hats and become on the buy side with suppliers. So then it's all of a sudden it's like, well, it's, you know, I have to have a much better price. I have to have a better price. I have to have a better price. So, you know, my encouragement there is figuring out those places, those opportunities, and work with your supplier partners to find that profitable pieces of business. Because when we're when we're both profitable, we're all winning, and we're all going to be growing. Heck yeah! Right. So, um, all right. Well, I, at that um, on that note, I want to come back after the break and talk about. Um, the culture side and dig into that a little more and talk about people and how to start shifting our mentality about profit and uh, and managing toward the bottom line. So we'll be right at we'll be right back after a quick message from our sponsor. All right. You know we live in a time of continual disruption to the industrial supply chain, from tariffs and trade wars to the Amazon effect on buying behavior. Not to mention the internal challenges you face trying to navigate new technology recruiting, educating, and empowering your team. These are real concerns for small to medium-sized industrial suppliers. They keep you up at night, and they threaten your mission to provide for your family, your employees, and ultimately, to build a legacy that stands the test of time. I've been there. My family's business has worked with independent distributors for over 40 years. SpinStack was founded as an answer to the challenges our peers and partners faced with big box competition, changing technology, and rapid consolidation. Today, we offer three simple but powerful services that help industry Davids defeat Goliath. They are e-commerce, printed catalogs, and inbound marketing. Our e-commerce solution for distributors has been developed by over 15 years of hands-on experience, listening and adapting to the changing needs of our clients. We offer personalized B2B and B2C website design, development, hosting, and maintenance. We also believe in the power of beautiful print. SpinStack started by curating product content from the industry's top suppliers. We combine that product database with an airtight production process that makes printed catalogs of every shape and size available and affordable to the masses. Finally, we kept our finger on the pulse of digital marketing best practices by teaming up with HubSpot to provide marketing automation, lead generation, and nurturing strategies. Regardless of where you're at in your industrial supply journey, our energetic team has the experience and know-how to guide you to a bright future filled with opportunities to grow. Put your fears to rest and conquer the moment today by scheduling a consultation with the industry's most recognized agency. If you're ready to grow, let's go. Back um, here with my dad, Wayne Johnson, and we've been having a great conversation about profitability and managing your supply business to the bottom line. And, um, you know, before the break, we had talked a little bit about culture and training your staff and training yourself 
how to think uh, better about profitability. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that? What are some things that you had to do either with your leadership team or on the sales side or customer service side? What are some things that you had to do to, to get people to realize that it wasn't always about, you know, giving away the, the deal no matter what. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, culturally for us, uh, that really meant starting with getting everybody in place and managing, first of all, to their budget lines. So getting everybody up kind of a hardcore budget that they work to, to collaborate, to develop. It's not like we said, here, this is your budget, you manage it. We work with them to collaborate and build a budget. Uh, but then it's holding everybody accountable and we certainly culturally do that through a team effort. So uh, budget meetings are held in, on our monthly leadership team meetings and everybody's budget is reviewed personally, individually, first of all, but then as a group. And so if somebody's over budget, then we're all kind of challenging and saying, hey, what can we do to help get you back on track? And why are we there? Do we have to make any adjustments? So it became kind of culturally a, a big change in, um, in the KPIs that people are measured on. So they might have previously been measured on, as I said, sales, or they might have been measured on quality or deliveries or on-time performance or whatever. But switching culturally that number one priority to budget and are you on top of performance? Um, that's, that's kind of the first thing. And then um, letting them manage that culturally all the way down the line with all their employees. Uh, so that, you know, it's not like we're training every employee on budget, but we're utilizing that concept to make sure we stay on task to, to improve the bottom line every year. Was there a lot of, I mean, going from, I think, I think we're honest for a small business owner out there. Uh, you know, very few of us have really documented budgets. Um, there may be a, a global budget, but mm -hmm. I doubt very much that a lot of people have departmental budgets. So when you implemented those departmental budgets, um, was there, was there a, um, you know, a season where we had to, um, we had to do some coaching and, um, was there pushback on that? Oh, no, actually, you know, I think we might have thought that there would be and that would be kind of a common thing. But I think in our particular case, it was like the sense of joy and relief that um, we were actually putting the opportunity for them to manage their department, not only um, to other KPIs, but actually to the expense side as well. So it wasn't like we we got together and just said, hey, your department budget's cut by $100,000 so we can make profit. We didn't do it that way. We we set an overall company goal and then matched by, matched by department. And I think there was just a big embrace and a, and a joyous moment because they said, hey, I finally have some control over what's going on. And I can, it's my decision where to spend the money that's in my department. You know, for example, on raises, you know, we might say, hey, uh, average raise pool for employees is 3%. But that doesn't mean every single employee gets 3%. That just means that the department head can take his, his pool or her pool and divide it up however way they want. You know, Some people might get 1% and others might get 6% or 5%. Um, and that let them, that kind of philosophy, but it also extended way deeper into other aspects of the business. So uh, I think it's quite an empowering moment when you let people in on that moment. Uh, and that's hard for a private business owner, right? Because we're running things through the business. We're doing some other things that are probably affecting the bottom line. Um, but you know, we, and, and we were probably no different, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, some trip that she was, we told a work trip that we had a little more fun and vacation with than we should have. But we normalize that expense back out so that we can see the true bottom line. Like, had we not expensed that, this is what the profit would have been. And so that helps everybody, uh, that everybody that's on the leadership team feel good about what they're doing in terms of managing that budget. I think that's so telling that um, it really does create a sense of freedom, you know, to be able to, to understand. Now, 
these are the rules of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think when you don't have a budget and you're not holding folks accountable to that budget, there is, uh, it's almost like uh, you're operating out of a fear, like, and every single thing has to get approved and, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're not sure if you're, you know, because I mean, a lot of times you're you're worried about is this too much of an expense, or you have um, the complete opposite, where it's just complete and total rogue spending. Right. You know, some product management person or purchasing person goes, "Hmm, I see a really good deal on something. I'm going to bring in a couple of container loads," and all of a sudden, you've spent a lot of money, and you you know, so um, you can have rogue spending going both ways, but. So you can either have the fear aspect or you could just have the, there are no limits. I can just do whatever I want, mm-hmm. <laughs> which, which one's worse. <laughs> so, you know, having, giving folks, you know, the opportunity to contribute to building the budget helps create that ownership yeah. and then giving them the freedom to operate within that budget that they've had a, a say in building in the first place. Um, that's really helped change a lot of the culture mm-hmm. you would say. So, I think I think that's that's really great news for us to hear, um, and you know when it comes down to you know some real practical ways that you've changed the way that you've operated as as a principal. What are what are some of the things that you've done over the last ten years to manage better towards the bottom line? Well, I think it all begins at the beginning, and for any good company that begins with strategic planning. So you have to be intentional about how business goes. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be, oh, well, that was cool. Look what happened and we grew. Or uh, Hopefully it's intentional growth or it's intentional uh, direction. And I know we had a discussion about strategic planning before, but look, it's, when we build strategic plans, we don't, our KPI is EBITDA, right? So what are we gonna do and how is it gonna affect even though is it gonna is it gonna add x dollars to the bottom line so when we set our strategic plans uh they're all built towards growing that bottom line even done number that's first and foremost and i think that's kind of our the biggest thing that we do is um you know we try to get that number in mind and then work backwards from that as we build out our budget so you you have that idea of what you want to keep out of the business, right? And from there, you're looking at okay, what are we going to experience? Um, you know, kind of projecting out sales, mm-hmm. right? You're thinking, what kind of attrition are we going to have? Well, which kind of what kind of growth do we need to have in order to you know to hit that bottom line number, right? Um, so is there is there anything that's changed about that? Um, like, are you more conservative with your sales forecasting, for example? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I think we still do a good sales forecast. Um, but there's a lot of consolidation and a lot of things that are still happening in this space. So from our standpoint, you can't always control everything that happens. Um, but we're still pretty aggressive with, with our sales growth plans, but we, we also develop strategies that are, that we're able to control the cost of obtaining those sales, right? So it's a lot easier when you have a limited amount of customers to sell to, uh, and you're not just out there trying to, you're not trying to pioneer new business and new, new markets and stuff. Those are expensive and those really don't. Those are great because we all want diversification, but those are tough times to grow bottom line because you're going to make some investments. One of the things that I really struggled with, um, or, you know, even as recent as last year was just, um, the idea of forecasting. And I didn't realize until just recently, you know, that businesses like mine, you know, a marketing agency, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they can experience, you know, 20 to 30% attrition yeah. every year. Right. And, you know, when you'd go into strategic planning and I'd go in there and I'd be like, well, we're going to grow 25%, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but in order to grow 25%, you've got to, it's really, you're really growing 
50 percent mm-hmm. you know or more right to to really get there and uh because you have to account for the attrition and i know that a lot of distributors it can be very similar you know they lose one account or one or two accounts and those are you know big top 10 accounts um that can be that can be huge so how do you i don't know if you're if your manufacturing business is similar um but you know it's more of it seems like it's a little more volatile mm-hmm. for smaller businesses like us so how, what would your encouragement be to folks like us who you know we've we are going to experience some attrition uh-huh. we're going to lose a couple customers throughout the year sure um how do we how do we plan for growth so that we're being realistic so that we don't end up hiring you know salespeople we can't afford or you know buying too much inventory or whatever we're doing well, yeah, and again, it's probably all about pivoting, right? So you um, you kind of plan for a year, and then I think as the year goes along, if things change, then you have to pivot, and you have to you have to make changes. It's not like you have to wait until December thirty first to make a change, right? Because um, certainly we set forth a strategic plan. We said it's going to go from here to here. We have milestones along the way. We knew what we were going to hit. But if something bad happens along the way, then you have to pivot. And when you pivot, it's like maybe you have an alternate budget. So you create a new budget and you say, well, based on this budget, in order to still get to the same bottom line, we have to control our cost of this. And and you have to make those hard decisions. But look, at the end of the day, you're, you're providing jobs, you're providing um, security for your employees. Uh, and also your yourself and your shareholders and your investors, and you have to manage that. You can, it's not acceptable to kind of get to December and go, well, you know, we didn't make any money because we lost three big customers. I think that's really important. I think what what I think what we have in our mind is, you know, if if you're like me, you're you're always an optimist, mm-hmm. and you're just you you have a game plan and you're following it through. And you have a couple of road bumps, you know, blo- road uh, blocks on the way, right? And it just slows you down. And but you think, well, it's gonna come, it's gonna come, yeah. But it may never come, and that's why it's so important to have, like you said, a backup plan, mm-hmm. knowing that if this happens, you know, if we lose our top, you know, couple of customers, this is what this is what we're gonna do next, right? And already have that decided and agreed upon, you know, heading into mm-hmm. the year, right? Right. I think that's really good advice. Yeah, and you know, you, you're kind of um, you're kind of driven by that uh, by looking at that bottom line and looking at that EBITDA number and making sure that it's what you're what's meeting your expectations and. You know, it might be a good number, but it might not meet your expectations. So you might still be having a great year, but the difference is you might have been, your expectation might have been for a phenomenal year. So. And, you know, just as I'm as we're wrapping this up, the one thing that we didn't really touch on that I was thinking about was as a business owner, you're really, before you even start strategic planning, you're really trying to figure out that acceptable EBITDA number based on your personal goals, right? Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, you're, what you're trying to do is create your own lifestyle, your own life that you're um, you know, happy about. And you know, working from there, you're trying to figure out, well, does that, what does that mean? What do mm-hmm. I need to create so that, so that I have money to reinvest in the business, so that I can reinvest for my own financial future, so that I can, you know, do the things that I want to do with my life and take my kids on vacation and all of this sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it really even starts before strategic planning and thinking about what you want to do as a business owner and what's an acceptable net margin, right? Right. So does that is that conversations that you guys have um, from time to time, even if it's just like on the golf course or out to dinner or something like that? <laughs> um. Yeah, I think we, I, I don't think we pick a kind of a number um, because we're probably a little bit past that concept, but uh, 
we're looking for a growth percentage. You know, do we want to double that line? Do we want a 50% growth? What's the, the number? And so we've been focusing on kind of our attempt has always been to try to double that number every year. And that's a big lofty goal, especially the higher you get. But it's, we've been able to kind of get there for years after year after year. Um, so I think that you have to you have to try to grow to something that you think is achievable, first of all. Like, no point in me saying, hey, I want to have $100 million of EBITDA next year and, and not have, and there'd be no way to get there, right? So I, I have to pick an achievable number, but, um, but yeah, it, it certainly starts with that. And then how can you get that? Like, what's the, what's the four or five things I can do to make sure I get that? And remember, we kind of break them down into people, products, processes, and customers. So you, you kind of look at those four areas and say, how can we, how can we fix that? So um, last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, how, what can I be doing, or where should I be spending my time as a business owner if I'm a, you know, just talk to mm-hmm. me. But, you know, I could be a, I could own a small distribution company or a small manufacturing company. What, what, um, what would you say to me? How should I be spending my time day to day? Like, what does my day look like mm-hmm. if I'm going to be managing my business to the bottom line? Yep. So first of all, in your case where you kind of have a fixed set of costs, um, it's understanding those costs and making sure that day to day, week to week, month to month, you keep those costs in check, uh, that they don't just sort of randomly go off like, um, and you avoid those um, those whims to just go, oh man, we had a great order, let's celebrate with lunch from Panera when it was never budgeted, or you didn't have lunch for the team in your budget, or that's probably a bad example. Or, you know, Because <laughs> that's only like $35. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get it. No, no going out to Roost Chris. Yeah, no going out to Roost Chris, <laughs> right, yeah. And it's different in our case when we have 320 employees, right? So right. lunch from Panera is expensive. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, uh, no, you're right. It's no going out to Roos Chris to go, hey, wow, look what we did. And right, then, right. You know, you blow a lot of that profit. So. Stay in your budget. Yeah, stay in your lane. And um, and when you got all the costs under control, then it's just about growing. It's just about getting revenue. Because you really make a good point about attrition, Right. Customers are always going to lose, leave, and to get ten percent growth, you probably have to grow twenty percent. So, with the existing customers or with new customers, so yeah, attrition is one of those little sort of non thought of things, you know. Like, and so in our sales report, one of our it's in Excel basically, but in our sales reports that go out, we have the biggest losers tab, and so you can look at the biggest loser tab and see where are you losing ground and. And hopefully focus on them and try to turn them around. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, work, attrition's key. To and and obviously assessment. always working on business development, right? That's mm-hmm. what you're saying because you can always you, you always guaranteed to have some sort of attrition. You know, even mm-hmm. if you're Amazon or you know if you're yeah. Apple, you know they're losing customers to Google every day. They lost sure. me, for example, right? I moved from a, a smart an iPhone to a a pixel. Mm-hmm. So that the stuff happens and but one thing you can always do is continue to hammer away at business development, right? Right. Keep building relationships, keep marketing and and selling your your business. Yeah. Um because you you, Listen, you always need it. Take care of your cost. Take care of your employees. Number 1. Take care they'll take care of your customers. And then um, hopefully all that will contribute to the bottom line and taking care of you. So teach them well, teach them right, make sure they take care of customers right, you know, but, you know, no giving stuff away. That's not taking care of customers. So, yeah, teach them what good customer service is. All right, very cool. Awesome advice as usual. Thanks for uh, coming on the show again, Dad. Appreciate your time. All right. Thanks.